Philadelphia from the College of Education, Temple University. This is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Associate Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. Today's special guest is Robert McCloskey. From his very own island in Maine comes the outstanding author-illustrator Robert McCluskey. We appreciate so much your staying in the cold northeast beyond the time you'd normally leave for your winter home just to do this program. It was no great chore. Uh, my wife, as a matter of fact, is grateful uh, for the delay. She likes to stay behind. Uh, to at least this date to put her garden to bed before leaving for the south. I see. Since you winter in the Virgin Islands, have you always preferred to live near water? Well, no. I was born in uh, Ohio, as a matter of fact. Uh, a river did run through the town, but no large body of water. I uh, ended up in Maine after World War II, and uh, so some people enjoy living in the mountains and some people in the prairies. I seem to have en ended up on the water. Uh, it seems that you know how to get the most out of life in choosing such pleasant settings. Well, uh, I'm fortunate in the fact that I can carry my business more or less in my pocket, my illustrating and my writing, or at least pack it in a small suitcase. That's true. Joining us in welcoming you is Carolyn Field, coordinator of work with children for the Free Library of Philadelphia. You're Hello, a good Bob. friend. Hello, Carolyn. Welcome. It's always a pleasure to see you and to Great be back to see here, you in here in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. In the audience are teachers, librarians, and students who very much enjoy your books. We'll share with them some photographs you've brought with you. The first two are of your permanent residency in Maine. This is uh, a view off the front terrace of my home. This is the home, and it's uh, on an island in Penobscot Bay. The next two are of your winter residency in the Virgin Islands. That's uh, high on a hill, not nearly as close to the water as uh, in Maine. It's uh, in the state Dorothea. And now we have a photograph of your two daughters, Sal the older and Jane the younger, taken about a dozen years ago. That's uh, Sally in her flute playing period and Jane uh, accompanying on the piano. And uh, I'm making a drawing. Uh, I take it took advantage in those years of every opportunity to make drawings of Sal and of Jane. Uh, my daughters, when they found out that other children didn't have to pose for their father, uh, sort of went on strike. And <laughs> I had to take an opportunity of every time they were more or less quiet to make drawings of them. Now we have the Regina Medal given by the Catholic Library Association for your collective work. We're going to appreciate your children's books, all published by the Viking Press. Though they run the gamut of emotions, they especially show a fine sense of humor, which helps to keep them timeless. Beginning with your earliest work, autobiographical lentil published in 1940. See the humor in this bathroom scene. Aren't those fixtures remembered from your childhood home in Hamilton, Ohio? My grandmother's home. Oh. That crazy washstand was there and the bathtub with the claws for feet. Yeah. Your second book, Make Way for Ducklings, is so famous it's almost a classic. 
it brought you this Caldecott Medal in 1942. Well, that, uh, the theme of the ducklings is uh, more or less of a universal theme. I uh, managed to get clippings from, well, all corners of the world uh, about ducks crossing the road. Uh, in uh, Copenhagen, for instance, they uh, use it as a travel poster, and they have uh, here is a what a postcard of of ducks crossing a street. I don't know that you can see this very well yeah. on the, yeah, and they also have it printed on handkerchiefs and and uh, oh, it's ducks crossing the road. Um, is a, such a common experience that uh, they Maybe use it Carolyn in newspaper show. articles and ads. And when it, when something of that kind hits the press service, well, uh, I get uh, dozens of, of photographs or reproductions of ducks crossing the road. After Make Way for Ducklings came Homer Price who shone mugging with his face inserted in the bust of his famous namesake. He's the lad atop Uncle Telly's ball of used string. Uncle Telly really saved a lot. Equally humorous is Mike Murphy's musical Mousetrap, also from Homer Price. In the sequel, Centerbird Tales, some folk are shown having fun while almost destroying the library. In 1949, your Blueberries for Sal was a Caldecott honor book. Did this scene involving your daughter Sal and a mother bear actually take place? Not with a mother bear, but uh, I, the story occurred to me one afternoon when uh, we were all out as a family in the blueberries. Peggy was picking indus industriously and Sally was picking and eating and kaplink, kaplink, kaplunking a few berries in her uh, little pail. Uh, I added the bear. I was sitting there with my sketchbook uh, in a dreamy fashion, and uh, that's where the, when the story occurred to me. Where was the model for the old-fashioned kitchen stove on the end paper of blueberries for Sal? In uh, Sal's grandmother's house. Uh, uh, Sal's grandmother was uh, Ruth Sawyer, and uh, I thought the, her stove was much more amusing, making better, more interesting drawing than the white uh, gas stove that we were using at that time. And Ruth Sawyer, we all know to be such a famous storyteller and writer, so you have a fine literary family. Next came one Morning in Maine, which was also a Caldecott honor book. Here an older Sal is shown hunting for her lost tooth with you. Do you look in the mirror when you're drawing yourself? Oh yes, uh, not only uh, for drawings of myself, but uh, I keep a mirror in my studio uh, at all times. Uh, when I'm drawing a hand or a, uh, a foot or I just look at an action in front of the mirror and it helps me with my drawing. So you're your own model often? Well, very often, yes. It's As hard. I say, it's, uh, it's hard to it get them. It was hard to get uh, Sal and <laughs> Jane to pose and, and <laughs> Peggy too, as a matter of fact. Uh, that Peggy to, is your wife. Peggy People is don't my know. wife, uh -huh. yes. In 1958, your time of wonder brought you this second Caldecott medal. That's truly amazing. Two Caldecott winners and two Caldecott honor books. In 1963, your Bert Dow, Deep Water Man, was published in full color. Here we see Bert watering the flowers in an old boat. Among other things, the story tells of Bert on the ocean putting a Band-Aid on one whale and all the other whales becoming envious. I wonder if you get much pupil response to Bert Dow, Deepwater Man. Oh yes, pupils, yes. But uh, not only pupils, but uh, 
from uh, Bert's friends and neighbors and, and uh, from adults too. Uh, Bert uh, was a real live uh, neighbor of mine. Uh, that boat, Tidally Idly, was a real boat. Uh, I owned the boat. I traded an old gas engine uh, for it, traded with Bert. Uh, to get the boat to my island, I had to take it there aboard a scow, a barge, because uh, otherwise it would have been on the bottom. It was so leaky. I had the boat sitting around there for years, wondering just how I was going to use it in the story, and until the, the tale of Bert Dow finally evolved. Uh, I have, uh, I had just last week a letter from uh, a class in, I think it was North Carolina, uh, saying that they'd won $50 and had spent it on a boat. Hmm. Uh, they were going to move the boat into their library and uh, upholster it and put in a few pillows and have it as a special spot in which to read. Uh, then two, uh, Captain Haskell's brother, uh, put up a lovely uh, headstone, tombstone, for Bert in the local cemetery. Bert is having, is, I think I told you Bert had died. Uh, a lovely tombstone inscribed, Bert Dow, Deep Water Man. Ah. And I think you told me previously that the library is going to call that boat Tidely Idly. The li their library is going to call it Tidely Idly, yes. Uh, you also illustrate books written by other authors. Here's your cover for Keith Robertson's Henry Reed Incorporated, another Viking Press book. Henry resembles you. Is that intentional? No. Uh, there again, you know, I, I look in the mirror always as uh, I use myself over and over again as uh, for details, hands, or just the attitude of a head. And uh, any resemblance to me is, is coincidental. Uh, that's a very common thing. Uh, trait for an author to um, make uh, drawings that look rather like himself. Uh, Jimmy Doherty's Abraham Lincoln looks a little bit like Jimmy Doherty <laughs> looked, and his uh, <laughs> Ben Franklin looks a little like, well, and for that matter, with me, even my ducks look a little bit <laughs> like me. So. That's, they looked more like me when I had a crew cut some years ago. So. <laughs> I can see you're not only a humorist on paper. Yeah. Uh, Weston Woods, under Mort Schindel, has been both the producer and distributor of films of your books, and we're going to see excerpts from two. The first is from Make Way for Ducklings. Mrs. Mallard, with the help of, pol of the police, is shown leading her ducklings through the traffic to the Boston Public Garden. And they waddled along till they came to the highway. Mrs. Mallard stepped out to cross the road. Honk, honk! Went the horns on the speeding cars. Quack! Went Mrs. Mallard. And the cars kept speeding by and honking. And Mrs. Mallard and the ducklings kept right on quack, quack, quacking. They made such a noise that Michael came running, waving his arms and blowing his whistle. He planted himself in the center of the road, raised one hand to stop the traffic, and then beckoned with the other, the way policemen do, for Mrs. Mallard to cross over. As soon as Mrs. Mallard and the ducklings were safe on the other side and on their way down Mount Vernon Street, Michael rushed back to his police booth. Bob, I saw that exact incident happen in Boston, outside of Simmons College, as our ducks crossed the Fenway with the policemen holding them up. I'll bet it's happened other places in the world, too, don't you? Oh, yes. Uh, it's a universal uh, experience, I think. I got uh, photographs in the mail, uh, well, from as far away as India, Showing really? Ducks, uh, no. Doing uh, the same thing. Doing the same thing, holding up ducks. traffic, yes. Well, tell me, how did you uh, get models for the ducks? And where did you get them? And uh, I had a studio in New York uh, City at the time, and uh, I 
Uh, I bought some mallards, and I had them wandering around in my studio, and I bought some ducklings, had them there too. Well, uh, how could you get close enough to them to see the wings? I know that you have taken many, many sketches. Right. I, well, I tried, uh, I tried a number of ways. The most successful was getting them drunk. <laughs> <laughs> On what? Red wine. Oh. They, they loved it. They loved really? it. Really? Yeah. And what did you do? Have to follow them around on the uh, crawl around yeah, the floor I, after I them? Yeah, I went around on the floor after them. Yeah, uh, the uh, male mallard was—he uh, was a real uh, masochist. He he chased the females away from the wine dish, ah. and he would <laughs> For he would creep up there and and he would get to the point where he couldn't uh, he could no longer uh, stay on his feet, and he would just stretch out on the road, on the on the floor. And every time he uh, he felt thirsty, he'd, he'd <laughs> do this. And, and uh, if the females came up close, well, he'd give them a peck, <laughs> send them scooting. You uh, followed them with Kleenex, I'm told. That, that was a very important <laughs> part, yeah. Uh, also, at the time, didn't you have an apartment mate? Uh, yes, uh, Mark Seamont, uh, who, by the way, now illustrates uh, children's books, too. He's the Caldecott winner for a tree is nice. Mm -hmm. That's that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was cooperative with duck noises? Well, uh, he didn't like it very much. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, with the studio light, well, the ducks woke up at dawn. Oh. So they, they start the day with making little duck noises. And, uh, he, he was very unappreciative. Our next film clipping by Weston, from the Weston Woods film is from The Donuts, from your book, Homer Price. First, we'll see your drawing of too many donuts from your book. The background for the clipping is this. A wealthy lady stops at the coffee shop of Homer Price's Uncle Ulysses. When she finds that the shop is out of donuts, she insists upon mixing the donut batter herself, first removing her jewelry and putting it on the counter. She mixes far too much batter, and the machine overproduces. It won't even stop when the off button is pressed. Later, she discovers her diamond bracelet, bracelet must be accidentally cooked inside a donut, and she offers a $100 reward for the return of her jewelry. When Homer announces this, the shop is stormed with the after-theater crowd. Notice Mr. McCluskey in the mob scene. enjoyed working in that that production Bob it was a lot of fun it was uh, of course in my short hair dig days well the children ever uh, write to you or tell you about dramatizing the stories or uh, doing other things make inventing things the way you did quite often I get uh, uh, photographs or rather reproductions from school papers and local newspapers of uh, various library groups or classes that have dramatized the donut story and oh. others of my stories. 
uh, and occasionally they make models of the lunchroom with uh, the characters carved out of soap. And I remember one that uh, had a counter that was a model of Ulysses' lunchroom, and it was full of donuts. And the do donuts were those little cereal things that are. Oh, uh, yes, uh, Cheerios. Cheerios. Cheerios, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's mm -hmm. cute. Well, uh, what are your future plans, or what are you working on now? Is there anything you can tell us about? Well, uh, I can mention that I'm working on puppets and uh, working on story uh, on a format for a program using puppets, uh, puppets along with live action, live people. Uh, I've been working on it so long now, I've, I'm beginning to be embarrassed about talking about it. It's uh, superstitious, really, if I, I should just shift. Well, I know I've heard you, uh, that you're working on your puppets. Uh, what other hobbies do you have? A puppetry is maybe a hobby, but it's also work. But do you have any hobbies? Well, uh, well, no. I, I help my wife and her. She always jokes and says her hobby is, is cheese tasting. Oh, that's <laughs> whenever, good. whenever she comes mm -hmm. to that question on a questionnaire, she always says cheese tasting. Cheese tasting. <laughs> well, well I, don't, uh, I don't know. I can't pick out uh, any. Well, you, ha you do so many things, boating and all the other wonderful things. Well, uh, you are you also painting, though. Yes. Well, I don't consider that a, a hobby. I, I still consider my, myself as, as an artist. That having been my training, and the rest of this has just sort of come along. Uh, Actually, you started out as a muralist, uh, yeah, your first yes, uh, major yeah. work. Uh, you and I are both on the May Massey Memorial Committee, and May Massey was the great children's editor. Yes. Did she really help you? What? How did you work with her, Bob? Oh, I would never have. Uh, I would never have been in this business if it hadn't been for her. For May. She, uh, I went to see her in her office in New York, and and. Uh, I had these drawings I had made. Uh, she liked my drawings, but she said, uh, I don't have anything for you to illustrate now. Uh, but she says, uh, I can tell by your drawings uh, that uh, you can tell a story. And uh, she says, why don't you go home and, and write one? Mm -hmm. So uh, I went home and, and came back with Lendl my first book. She did a tremendous amount to develop new talent. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, wonder if you could tell us what's happened today with your daughters, Sal and Jane. Well, uh, Sally is uh, a hardworking young attorney. She and her husband have uh, opened up a law office on the, in the town of Deer Isle. Uh, that's in a Maine? Yes, in Maine. That's a neighboring island to the one uh, I live on. And uh, Jane uh, hasn't really uh, made up her mind what she's going to do. She went into the boat building business, and that lasted up for about three months. And uh, she is now working with leather and uh, making sandals and shoes, along with a friend. Uh, they both. Uh, have built their own houses, uh, Sally and her husband, and uh, Jane has built hers. It's a small house, but uh, adequate for her. Uh, I think that brings up to more, date? more or less up to you date. You told me you were a four-boat family in Maine. Is that true? <laughs> well, yes, living on an island, that, uh, that's uh, almost a necessity. Uh, we're always having need for two, uh, at least two boats, and uh, sometimes we leave one here and one there, and it's a little bit like fox and geese to uh, collect them all and get them back where you, you, can, you, you need them at the moment. Bob, uh, I know you said you received a lot of mail, and I imagine most of it's from children, although adults may write. What sort of uh, comments do they make or uh, remarks about your books? or? Do they ask you particular questions about your work? Yes, some of them ask uh, questions. Uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the questions most asked is uh, why I 
put five robbers in the bed in uh, oh, Homer Price, Homer Price. Uh, uh, rather than four, as I'd had in the story. And, uh, well, it's just that I've forgotten how many I had. I made that, uh, <laughs> well, there's a, there was a considerable time lag uh, from the time I wrote that story and the time I made that illustration. Mm -hmm. This was way back. I was uh, about to be drafted into the Army, uh, World War II. And uh, I'd completed the whole the book uh, and the drawings, and I was expecting my draft uh, notice any day, and suddenly I had a letter or a quick call from Viking Press that uh, the, to make the book balance out and to avoid an embarrassing blank spot that they needed a drawing of, uh, for this particular spot of the robbers in bed. So I sat down quickly and made this yeah. drawing. Um, then I marched off to the Wallers, and, and uh, uh, by the time they had discovered it, uh, well, it was well, it wasn't too late. I guess I could have managed to do it, uh, but they allowed us how they would let it go. Well, it certainly yeah. is a conversation piece, yeah. and it, it incites children to uh, write well, and write out about it. Well, someone asked me why I didn't change it at one time. I thought that well, if I start changing drawings and I'll be they'll think yeah. of something else for me to change uh, so it stays like that uh, the, the Japanese though in their edition did change it. oh did they yeah mm -hmm. they just couldn't bear the uh, <laughs> the uh, discrepancy did they blot it out or did they they made a new drawing made a new uh, oh. yeah, yeah. Do, do they have that right well, uh, I don't know. They may have written and asked Viking. They didn't ask me, but uh, the rest of the uh, the rest of the drawings are are the same. I think they did change the jacket slightly, but the Japanese ed edition is uh, very fancy. It comes in a box and it's uh, very beautifully printed. Thank you very very much, Robert McCloskey. Mr. McCloskey, as artist, inventor, musician, and humorist, has had the pleasure of seeing his books translated in many lands. Because he created Make Way for Ducklings, some people consider him to be a duck expert. <laughs> when a mallard laid eggs in the Boston penthouse garden of a life insurance company, a secretary rushed to the phone. She didn't dial an ornithologist. No, indeed. She called Robert McCluskey and with anguish in her voice asked, how do I get them back to the park? <laughs> That's the price of fame. Thank you very much for being with us. It's been a great pleasure.